Here is game five of the World Chess Championship final between Yan Nupomnishi playing white against Ding Liren playing black. We've had a lot of drama so far. Honours are even to all, but there was more drama to come in this game. Nepo plays his customary e4, no dabbling with d4 today. And once again, we have a Spanish. And this time, Nepo plays more of a main line. So we saw in that first game, bishop takes c6, which was interesting, got Nepo some advantage, but today Nepo plays more traditionally with d3. You could say the old main line here is rook e1, but d3 has really come to the fore over the past 20 years. Big favourite of Magnus Carlsen, of course. So the threat, because now this pawn is defended on e4, the threat really is to take on c6 and then e5. So black has to do something about that. So b5 knocks back the bishop and d6 stabilises the centre. Now Nepo in the past has mainly played a3. I should say both players have a lot of experience in this position. But today he went for c3 pretty normal. Um, you can see that in this position, well, because the centre is stabilised, the e-pawn is protected, black actually threatens to play knight a5 to exchange off that beautiful bishop that is so often the key to white's strategy in this opening. So that's why c3 or sometimes a3 is played, just to give the bishop an escape square out of the clutches of that knight. Castles, you know, all normal. And h3. Well, this can be a useful move later on. Um, it could be that white is thinking about playing d4 and doesn't want to allow the bishop to g4. But, well, it's kind of a multi-purpose move. Also something of a waiting move, actually. Bishop b7. Don't have to play with bishop b7. You know, because this pawn is well protected, I would say it's not, to my eyes, it's not the, the, the most natural move to make. But, well, many strong players have played this in the past, including Nepo himself, actually. But just a reminder, it's Ding playing black. Um, you could play knight a5 here, for example, and then in a more traditional way with c5. But bishop b7. And a4. So this is the, the, the standard way for white to play. Just reminding black that b5, you know, is a little bit of a target. White might be able to open the a file at some moment. b5 might come under fire. Knight a5 pushes the bishop back. And Nepo decides to put the bishop on a2. c5. So black is claiming some, some space in the centre. Later on you might be able to play c4. You might be also be able to play b4. And now bishop g5. So Nepo is going for a very typical light square strategy. You often see this in these variations where the pawns are on d3 and e4. Instead of forcing through d4... White is playing to control the d5 square and maybe later on to play on the king side. More about that later. Now, Ding forces this exchange. You could avoid this with playing knight d7 and go for this exchange. You might say this is um, a... a a very positionally sound way of playing. You get rid of that dark squared bishop. I mean, there are pros and cons to playing like this, but that's a reasonable way for black to play. But Ding, well, he's not bothered about this light square strategy and provokes this exchange on f6. But getting rid of that knight gives white chances, gives white great control over the d5 square, and later on, there might be more opportunities for white to play on the king side. 
An exchange on b5, and then knight d2. And you can see that this knight is a little bit stuck out on the edge, so Ding very sensibly decides to play it back into the middle. I mean, one big decision here is, should black break with d5, which is an attempt to sort of solve all the problems in the position? The only thing is, although these pawns might look impressive, they can be a little bit difficult to... To, to manage, you know, there's a lot to take care of here. They can all be weak at some point. So I can understand why Ding did not want to play that. But instead, just put the knight back on c6. It's a more, certainly a more stable way of playing this position. But it does allow this bishop to occupy that key d5 square. Ding exchanges rooks and plays queen d7 so you can see all these squares are covered so actually giving up the the a file isn't of any significance at all in fact it's black that manages to claim the a file and the queen swings back into the middle well we've arrived in an early middle game position we've had 19 moves that is absolutely typical of the Spanish. White has some control in the middle. Black has the two bishops, but certainly they're not doing much at the moment, particularly the bishop on f6 is rather blocked in. But Black has to decide on a strategy here. And there are you know, quite a few different moves you could choose. So one idea is to fight for control over d5 and play, for example, the bishop back here. This looks rather long-winded, and then rook a6, and then knight e7, you can see the knight covers d5 and f5. That's a possible way of playing. Although, you can see that, you know, maybe it, it takes a long time to arrange this. Um, what else could black play? You could also try uh, knight e7 directly. Allows an exchange of bishops. Now, white would play this typical manoeuvre with knight e3, but, well, the bishop can drop back to g7. This is possible. White still might get a little bit of initiative on, on the king side. h4 is a bit irritating, as we're going to see in the game. Another way of playing is just with g6 straight away, just to put the bishop back here, and, you know, maybe later on you can play h5 and bishop h6. But, again, h4, this is a very annoying move. Because if the pawn advances, then white can use the g5 square, and otherwise this pawn is going to advance to h5. Well, more on this strategy in a second. So you can see that white has, just has a little bit of initiative. But Ding chose bishop d8, and that's quite a combative move. You can see that this bishop sometimes it just isn't really doing much. Now, if, if any of you have seen my chessable course on the Kalashnikov, or indeed the book that I brought out on the Kalashnikov, you'll know that this is a really typical manoeuvre in that opening. Uh, and it's a similar kind of pawn structure with the pawns hit. I call this the bad bishop bounce. The bishop is going to emerge on b6. And that could be rather irritating for white's king. Suddenly clears the bishop out of the way so it's not going to be attacked by uh, a knight from g4 or d5. Although, yes, it could could be vulnerable on b6 as well. But it's an aggressive way for black to play. So, an interesting choice from Ding. Now, Nepo just runs with the typical Spanish strategy of playing that knight to e3. Could go to g3, but more likely to go to e3 when white wants to control the d5 square. And now Ding goes for knight e7, challenging d5. And the knight comes to e3. So this is, you know, it's a very strategic positional game that, that both players are playing. No great tactics at the moment. Bishop b6. So you can see the bishop is just far more active on this diagonal than on f6. 
Now, how do you play with white? I've been flagging this idea over the past few moves, and this is such a typical position where white has a very, well, to my eyes, a very natural strategy. If you, if you play the Spanish, you have to know about this idea. Okay, I'll give you a moment to think about it. Cheers, cup of tea time. Nepo played h4. So white just wants to gain ground on the king side with h5. And taking control over g6 gives you more control over f5. And you know, white is starting to develop quite a nice initiative on the king side. The question is, well, first of all, how should black counter this it's not easy so for example if you play h5 just blocking it then white can use this g5 square this didn't happen um, and this this is extremely dangerous so for example g6 queen f3 g4 already you can see the concentration of pieces on the king side is quite impressive and it is very difficult for black to relieve the pressure Okay, what else is there? You could play g6, but then h5. I mean, something like this would be absolutely horrific. And once that knight reaches here, well, this is clearly a winning position for white. And if g5, you can see that f5 square is weakened. And white just takes control, complete control on the king's side. If you want to see a good example of that, I would recommend the game Carlsen against Vitugov from... Fikonze, can't remember which year, 2018 maybe, 2019, something like that. But you'll find a zillion examples of that. So after h4, Ding is under some pressure. Now, he looks for counterplay on the queen side, probably wise. Queen c6, h5, claiming space, and now c4. So this is typical and, well, a very logical idea. He wants to just activate that bishop. Why not? You know, this is black's asset in the position. That bishop, let's let's use it. Nepo plays d4, which looks pretty sensible. And you can see that queen takes is possible, but then knight takes with a discovered attack. And in fact, white wins a pawn in that variation. So that's no good. So after d4, Ding played e takes d4 and knight takes d4. Ding played actively with queen c5, which actually turns out okay, but probably queen b7 is a bit better. Now, I think this position is certainly more pleasant for white, but black is pretty solid there. Instead, queen c5. And here Nepo missed a strong move. He played queen g4, but queen f3, just looking down at that rook, is very unpleasant. So you can see e5 with that discovered attack is a strong possibility. And if the rook moves over, then you go queen g4. And this is a better version than the game because that queen is going to slide down and attacks the rook when it reaches d7. That would have been better than the game. I mean, it's, a, it's very subtle, very subtle improvement, but definitely stronger. But queen g4 played, also dangerous. But ding plays well, queen e5, just matching white's queen over here. Knight f3, attacking the queen, which goes back to e6. And now knight f5. Well, that knight has been angling to get to f5 or indeed d5 over the past few moves in typical Spanish style. How should black deal with that? Here, Ding makes a misjudgment. He decides to exchange off the knight. Very understandable, given how strong that knight seems. But after queen f6, in fact, black is holding firm here. It's very hard for white to break through. I mean, it certainly looks more pleasant for white, but actually very, very hard for, for white to make progress here. Instead, D 
ding exchanged on f5 well at first glance you think well what's the problem you know this pawn structure is a little bit damaged but actually after this move white is taking control you can see that the queen and rook dominate the e-file the queen is on a beautiful central square attacking the rook which came to b8 and now I really like the way Nepo plays over the next few moves. I mean, there are lots of moves here for white, but Nepo was just very, very careful. First of all, rook e2. He didn't rush things. We've seen, we saw in the previous game, he rather rushed things and allowed uh, Ding a fantastic exchange sacrifice. Nepo did not do that here. So first of all, rook e2. Guards that slightly sensitive spot on f2. So guards b2. Not, not that it's threatened at the moment, but that's a, it's a careful move. Point is, black can't do much here. Bishop c5. Well, it's protected, and perhaps maybe later on looking for b4. Now g4. And this is incredibly powerful. So, well, clearly white is looking at some moment to, to break through with g5, but... Well, what happens if black just sits there? I should say that here, Ding played queen d8. Let's have a look at king h8. Let's just see what happens if black just holds the fort. Well, watch what happens. Queen d5, white has lots of ways to just slightly improve the position. Knight d2. So this one is spinning around to e4. Once again, we've got a game where there's just a monster knight f4 that drives the queen back and now knight e4 i mean this is a horrible position to have to defend you can see that that white is breaking through on the king side with with these moves potentially there's also rook d2 with pressure here i mean this is a miserable position to defend so that's white's idea white is just starting the squeeze with g4 ding retreated the queen doesn't change much. White's still in complete control here. Now again, Nepo didn't rush it. He played king f1. You could, I mean, it seems to me that making a, a move like king g2 or king h2 and just bringing the king up the board, similar to that last variation, is very attractive. Nepo went for king f1. I wouldn't have anticipated that. But actually, it works out very well. Let's have a look. Rook e4, and Nepo has something very clever prepared. Ding's just waiting. He doesn't have much to do here. g5, that's the breakthrough. So he wants to advance one of these pawns. h takes g5 and rook g4. So here is the point. Of course, black would like to be able to defend that pawn. Now, Ding did not do this. Why? Because after f6, here's a lovely move. Knight h4. This is absolutely crushing. You can see the knight wants to come in to check the king, and that'll check the king out in the middle. That's fatal. And if pawn takes knight, h6 is a winning move. If pawn takes, then check and mate. I mean, there is really no defense after knight h4. That's a zinger. Great move. So rook g4 just played. Ding tried to get some counterplay with rook a8. Knight takes g5. So white has made the breakthrough on the king side. You can see both these pawns under fire. Lines have opened and the king is in desperate trouble. Rook a1 check. King e2. So I think Nepo had envisaged this idea of playing the king to the middle a long time ago. And it's very interesting. He wants to, you know, keep... The, the king side clear and wants his king out of there. Um, looks slightly odd to me, but it works absolutely perfectly. After queen e7 check, knight e4. It's a self pin, but actually black can do nothing against this. So here, ding went for queen e8. But let me just show you this variation. What about a counter attack? What about rook a2? Doesn't this exploit the position of the king? Well, actually, White has a winning move for it. F6, simple breakthrough. And H6, the idea is just to push the pawn home. And there is nothing that black can do. You can even break through with the rook here. Don't take it. H7, H8. It is all over. Nothing to do. 
So knight e4 just played, queen e8 from ding. They've reached the time control. This is move 41. King f3. Well, white is basically going for this same breakthrough, um, among other things. I mean, there's plenty to do here for white. Um, yeah, h h6 and, and knight f6 is, is very tempting. Uh, it all looks good, h6 or f6. But So basically, Ding decides, OK, I can't live with the queen on d5. Understandable. So exchanges queens. What's really interesting is that white's initiative on the king side persists. F6. It's really thematic. If that's taken, once again the threat is just to push the h pawn. So for example, king e7, check, and h6, and the pawn goes through. It's so simple and so effective. G6. That got taken. This is the game. Well, there's no outside pawn going through. But what's interesting is that white simply has a winning attack here. Rook a2, king g4. The king is just going to move up and create a mating net. Rook h6. And here, Ding had had enough. Ding resigned. OK, let's just have a quick look. Why did he resign? All right, let's see what happens if... Black goes for counterplay. Well, it's too little, too late. Let's give a check. King f5, and on the next turn, knight g5, mate. I mean, there really is nothing to do here. Um, so, for example, here, it doesn't help. Check, and the king comes in, and either it's going to be mate or the pawn rolls through. In this position, this is basically the threat. It's a mating attack. Black has absolutely no defence. Um, Ding was actually very complimentary about Nepo's play afterwards. He said he'd missed this move g4 in this position. He'd Or missed is, is a strong word. I, I mean, he probably means just underestimated. You don't miss g4, but he'd certainly underestimated g4. Um, and he said it's a very good game. Played, played by him. Uh, Nepo said the position in general was not this position, but um, okay, the variation was part was part of my prep. But I should credit my opponent that for almost all the game he played quite sensible moves, and I think that's true. I think Ding played very, very sensibly. I think here he's under pressure, um, but he still had chances to defend this. But it wasn't his day. Um, but I think Nepo's preparation was excellent. He basically managed to achieve a position where certainly White's plans are much easier to see and to play than Black's. I think Black has a few problems to solve here before reaching equality. But Ding just didn't manage to equalise in the game. I think excellent strategic game from Nepo. So... The score after five games, 3-2, Nepo goes back into the lead. I mean, I think what's interesting about this World Championship match is that we've yet to get stability. You know, very often in these matches you see sometimes a series of draws. But here we just haven't had that yet. So the question is, can Ding strike back in the next game? But he shouldn't panic. Some stability would be good in this match. I think he just needs to, to remain calm. You know, we've only had five games. We've got 14. He needs to just calm down and stabilise, and he's still in this match. Anyway, it's fascinating stuff. Do join me for Game 6, which will take place tomorrow, Sunday. Thanks for watching.